All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Nicolas Franco from the product marketing team. Welcome to the teaching and learning roadmap series. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to go through some housekeeping items. All right. So um, participants are muted by default. This is as a courtesy to speakers. We want to make sure uh, that we avoid any accidental background noises. Uh, if you want to turn off the sound of each pop-up notification, please open the Collaborate panel on the bottom right corner of your screen, uh, click on the gear icon, select the notification settings, and then check the box for audio notifications. Uh, if you have any questions or comments during the session, please type them in the chat and one of our Blackboarders will do their best to answer. And I'll be posting some, some links uh, specifically about uh, the Q&A. So if you have further questions, uh, you can type them as well in the discussion board in our community site. And finally, the webinar will be recorded or is being recorded already, sent out in email and posted in the community site alongside with the deck as well. All right, so with that being said, I'm going to pass the mic to Nico. Nico, how are you? Doing well, thank you very much, Nico. Um, hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, everyone. I'm super excited that you're joining us for uh, today's roadmap webinar. We've got a really big group here, and there is a there is a ton to share and go through. Um, now, before we go into kind of the the really exciting part of the roadmap, the the features and capabilities. Um, I did want to start off with a really quick recap of the deployment models that currently exist for Blackboard Learn. And as most of you will know, there are currently three deployment models. There is self-hosted, where you host Learn yourself. There is managed hosted, uh, essentially using Blackboard's data centers. And there is SaaS, where Learn is hosted in the cloud using Amazon Web Services. And as you probably know, we are currently kind of on a transition to becoming fully SaaS-based, fully uh, cloud-based. About nine or 10 months ago, we made some really important announcements about self-hosted and managed hosted deployments. And I, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to reiterate some of that. So first of all, for our self-hosted clients, we continue to be committed to providing full support um, until the end of 2023. And we understand that there may be uh, regulatory reasons that prevent certain customers from making the move to SaaS. And again, we are committed to working together to find solutions for this. Similarly, the second announcement that we made is that we also announced that managed hosting will be supported until the end of 2022, and that continues to be the case. Um, if you have any questions about this, I do encourage you to, to get in touch and uh, have a conversation with your representative. Now, regarding that transition to SaaS, we are, we are actually making some really good progress here. Uh, as of today, we have 65% of our customers on SaaS, and we expect to be at 80% at the uh, end of the year. So in terms of the timelines from the previous slides, uh, we are on track. We're actually slightly ahead to, to kind of move all of our clients within the time frame uh, that we talked about. Now, being on SaaS gives you access to latest features, latest functionality, things like base navigation, Blackboard data, Blackboard assist, chatbot, but also things like zero downtime upgrades uh, and so on. Um, and with that, in terms of base navigation, uh, which, for those of you not aware, is kind of the more modern version of the uh, the main applications navigation. We have actually just crossed a really important milestone in that we now have more than 50%, actually 52% uh, of our SaaS customers using base navigation. And we do want to encourage everyone that hasn't made the move yet to really start thinking about this. Because we see kind of for institutions adopting base navigation, we see that kind of directly reflected in increases in uh, end user satisfaction. Um, now, moving on from uh, moving on from deployment options, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the different course experiences uh, that are available. Um, as most of you uh, will know, there are two different course experiences that are available. There is the original course view, which has been around for a very long time, and there is the ultra course view, which is our newer, kind of more modern uh, course experience. Um, I wanted to start off by zooming in on the original course view a little bit. And we've noticed that there is a bit of confusion out there. Uh, so I wanted to be very clear about a couple of things regarding uh, the original course view. 
First one is that the original course view is available on SAS. And so for self-hosted and managed hosted institutions that are thinking about moving to SAS, it is possible to have pretty much the same experience as what you're having today when using SAS, uh, plus some of the additional things that come with SAS. So that's the first one. Second one is that we are continuing to make investments in the original course view in a number of different areas. And Wade Weichel will be talking more about this as we go into the detail of the web uh, of the roadmap. And then the third one that I wanted to be very clear about is that the original course view will be available beyond that 2023 timeline. Um, so the, the self-hosted, managed hosted timelines that we talked about before, they are not connected to the original course view. And we do, we do want to give everyone plenty of time to make the move to the to the ultra course view. So I wanted to be very clear about this. Original course view will be available beyond 2023. Now, in terms of the ultra course view, uh, obviously we'll be spending a lot of our time today talking about uh, talking about kind of the latest additions and what what some of our plans are there. Uh, we did want to share kind of upfront one exciting milestone here as well, in that we now have 152 uh, customers that are fully on the uh, on the ultra course view. All right, so so shifting into product roadmap uh, a little bit more, we wanted to transition to something. We've actually been spending a lot of time on, um, and we'll in increasingly talk about going uh, going forward. And that is really our, our Learn Ultra product vision, and really thinking about where do we where do we see ourselves go in the next three to five years? What are the areas that we really want to focus on? That we really want to be good at, and what are some of the areas that we are, or some of the things that we are not going to do? And over the last months, and um, we've actually been talking to a lot of institutions, a lot of students, a lot of instructors to get their thoughts on how the pandemic has been going, kind of what some of the more permanent changes uh, are that we expect to come out of that. And that has really allowed us to, to kind of refine and sharpen our product vision uh, quite a bit, which has resulted in these, these five product pillars. And I'll do a very quick run through. Um, so at the center of these five pillars, we've got uh, what we call our pedagogy pillar, and that's the Kind of the combination of actionable personalized insights informed by rich data blended with deep research informed pedagogical understanding and community best practice and this central pedagogy pillar is surrounded by four additional pillars uh, one of which is efficiency is the idea that uh, the system is built around instructors and students natural workflow and becomes quicker uh, and more valuable over time second one is best in class this is all around uh, providing seamless integrations with and encouraging the use of best-in-class tools and resources and connecting with in-person institutional resources where possible. Third surrounding pillar is around progress, the idea that we want to show instructors and learners where they're at, how they're doing, what to do next, and help them in identifying their, uh, their next steps and, and support them in taking those. And then the last one is the collective pillar which is the idea of, of kind of creating a more, more of a shared experience, helping students and instructors build relationships, create ongoing feedback loops, provide mutual support, and create more authentic connections. Now, the reason why this is really important, why these pillars are really important is because this is something that we really use as, a, as an internal working tool, almost as an internal compass to help us make prioritization decisions from a roadmap perspective. And from a kind of in practical terms, what that means is that as we look at the, the long list of different things that we are, uh, that we could be doing, uh, we, really, we really try to look for features capabilities that have overlap with most, if not, uh, if not all, of these, uh, all of these pillars. So I wanted to at least introduce this. I, I completely agree that this was a really quick introduction. Uh, but there is a lot more to come on this. We'll talk a lot about this at BB World, including kind of some of the exciting features that this starts to translate to. And I'm hoping that as we go through today's uh, roadmap, that you'll see you'll see these pillars and these themes uh, kind of come back uh, pretty strongly. Which brings me to the last part that I wanted to cover is is kind of a little bit more about how do we determine uh, roadmap? Uh, and roadmaps are very complex, very fascinating uh, exercises. They evolve constantly. Um, and, and there's a lot of different sources of input that feed into it. There's, I mean, there's UX activities, generative research, conceptual validation, usability testing, feedback that we get from institutions, but also from users, user groups, market research, usage data, other types of inputs. And uh, one of the things that's really important is that 
kind of those inputs need to be aligned with kind of the product vision and direction, which then kind of when it's all brought together starts to lead to a prioritized list, which is what we'll, um, what we'll go through uh, today. Second part that I wanted to go through is really kind of how do roadmaps work and how uh, kind of certainty and confidence around, mo around roadmaps starts to, starts to decline the further out we try to look. And this is really important because we wanna make sure that we set realistic expectations uh, around roadmap. And generally the way we think about it is that uh, kind of there's, there's kind of three different time horizons, anything within the kind of one to three month time horizon we've got a very, very high level of confidence on. And uh, those things are either already in testing, they're in advanced development. We've got very high confidence on the, um, on the release dates. And we, we will ask you to kind of hold us accountable for anything that falls within that, uh, within that time uh, horizon. The second one is that kind of three to six months time horizon where we've got um, a pretty high level of confidence. Usually these items are in progress already got a good idea of what they will look like. We may not always know the exact release date yet, and changes can still happen based on testing uh, and so on. And then there's the third time horizon, which is uh, kind of looking more than six months out. And that's the point at which things become a little bit more uh, murky, I guess, where um, we will have a good idea of kind of the themes and areas of functionality that we, we want to prioritize. We may not always know kind of what exact features that will translate to. We will not have a confirmed timeline yet. Um, and so on. So, so that's really kind of the structure that we'll be using today as well. Um, the structure of the roadmap will, will reflect this. So we'll have a section on the original course view. We'll have a section on the ultra course view. Um, and each of those will consist of five different segments. One is that um, we'll start off with some highlights on what's recently been released, just, for, just to make sure that everyone's aware, but we'll not cover everything. Second section will be are there any recent changes that are worth calling out compared to the previous roadmap? And then the third section will be, okay, so what is in that one to three month uh, time horizon with the exact release dates? Fourth section will be what is in that three to six month uh, time horizon with highlights. Again, this, this won't include everything because there's just too much going on. Um, and then the last section will be kind of what's in that six, six months and out time horizon. Again, some highlights. Again, we won't have time to cover everything. So, so with that, that is kind of the structure that we'll run with. So with that, I'll hand it over to Wade Weichel with the uh, roadmap updates for the original course view. Over to you, Wade. Great. Thanks, Nico. <clears throat> so I'm Wade Weichel, a member of the Learn Product Management team, and uh, I'm going to walk through um, yeah, those, those areas for original course view, original experience. And the work that we've been doing is really focused on three areas. Uh, features that are meant to improve um, existing workflows for users, uh, improvements for accessibility based on third-party audits that we continuously conduct, and then also uh, expanding the global applicability of the product through improved localization. And uh, I'm going to start, as Nico mentioned, with some recent improvements. And for the first one, I'll actually start with a, a demonstration. Um, so let me go to my screen share here. And um, wanted to walk you through an enhancement to the content editor and support for third-party integrations. Uh, you know, it's really important in developing courses uh, to be able to use uh, different technologies, uh, new uh, capabilities, other features, and um, part of that is incorporating third-party tools. And in the past, that has traditionally been um, used uh, in, the, in the original experience uh, with what are called building block mashups. So it was a specific framework for uh, expanding and adding capabilities. Um, but it is one that uh, a lot of institutions are trans, uh, transitioning their integrations to the newer uh, LTI standard. Um, so, <clears throat> so in this uh, recent update, uh, those uh, embeddable tools now appear within the add content workflows. Uh, so not only do you see those mashups, uh, but also other tools. Uh, and for admins out there, uh, the ones that are going to appear to instructors are placements that are set to deep linking uh, or to uh, course content tools. For students, they're only going to see deep linking tools that you specifically set whether students can see those or not. So you have a lot of control, plus those additional controls that you have with things like institutional hierarchy nodes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, you know, maybe for today I'll just do a quick example with uh, Panopto. 
because um, this is going to be an example where it's embedded media. Um, certainly it could also be a link or a larger page document. Uh, you'll get the controls from that third-party tool that are specific to it. So in the case of Panopto, you know, I can look at different video libraries, I can upload videos to encode, I can create a new recording. I'm just gonna go ahead and select a video that I have created here. Uh, the tool is going to give you other options that would be specific. Uh, so these are Panopto controls for how that's going to display. Uh, and then the tool is going to tell the content editor how to display this. How big should the default be? Um, what should the behavior be? Is it a link? Is it an embed? Um, and, and that's how that will present. And I can save that. Oops, by giving it a name. Um, so let's go ahead and now return to Uh, cover some of the other recent improvements. Uh, so in November, we released an updated content editor. It had lots of new capabilities, um, streamlined a lot of use cases, but there were still some areas that used that could need that needed some improvement. Um, and so a number of these items we're working through. Some have been addressed. Here are five examples of things that we've worked on in the last few months. Uh, there's more to come, uh, so stay tuned. In this section, I'll, I'll highlight a couple of those. Another recent enhancement is in, uh, bringing Blackboard Assist to all of our user experiences, original experience, ultra experience, uh, the uh, Blackboard mobile app for students. And this is a way for you to promote your institutional services to students. Uh, you can feature different services at different times of the academic schedule, and there are also optional integrated partners that can help students 24-7, uh, especially at times where maybe uh, campus services aren't virtualized or available to students. Some other recent improvements I'll highlight. Um, notifications previously in the user interface were localized, but ones that left the system were not. So uh, emails, SMSs, uh, those were always in the system's default locale. But now those email and SMS notifications are localized to the user's preference when it's not the system default. Um, we are, uh, there's an enhancement as well recently for uh, helping uh, institutions really manage their course life cycles better. Uh, in many cases, you reach a point where there's an entire term or a year of courses that you want to store offline for future reference, maybe for an academic dispute or reference in the future. Um, but you need to be able to move those to some other storage location off of your active learn environment. Uh, and there are ways to do this in some of the other deployment models, but now for SAS, we have a bulk download script uh, to help administrators with uh, managing those processes. Uh, another uh, uh, enhancement I'll highlight is that uh, within the Blackboard app and the Blackboard Instructor app, uh, the messages uh, tool is now fully supported. So that includes things like push notifications, newness indicators, uh, the ability to pull and refresh and get new messages. Uh, all of that will be found within the mobile app for both uh, course types. So what are we working on right now? So some of the improvements that you can expect to see uh, very soon. Uh, we're making, uh, we're doing a series of projects around improving the inclusiveness of the product. Uh, you'll see Wade Fields talk a little bit more about this in his section. Uh, a couple I'll highlight here is that we're doing a pass through uh, the product and improving language within the product. So for example, references to master courses, whitelist, blacklist, that sort of language uh, and altering and improving that. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have ongoing third-party auditors reviewing our products for accessibility. And there were a number of items um, for the original course view that we've started working on last year and we're continuing to work on. We definitely prioritize those high and want to work through those. A few improvements you'll see. Um, one is with the full grade center. Uh, the structure of that, the headers, the tables will be better described. We're clarifying the button roll on certain buttons where that was missing. And we're going to be improving uh, the date picker navigation by clarifying for users how to work that interface. Uh, we're also expanding the languages of learn and, and broadening the applicability of that. Uh, we have previously supported Brazilian Portuguese. We're expanding that to do uh, Iberian Portuguese as well. And for our friends to my north, uh, we'll be adding uh, Francais Quebecois, uh, so Canadian French. 
Uh, some other projects that we're working on right now include improving the user experience when they maybe step away from their computer, uh, come back, and giving a warning when they're about to be timed out, uh, and then also indicating that you know they may be timed out rather than them maybe continuing to do something on the screen and trying to submit and then getting routed to the login page. So definitely improving the user experience that way. Um, Ally is a, a popular tool, a capability for improving accessibility of materials loaded into Blackboard Learn, but there are still some use cases that are important for students. Students may still um, be working on group projects with classmates or doing research, and the Ally file transformer really allows them to uh, create a different version of that that's more suitable to their learning style or use. Um, or perhaps it's a set of materials that's very complex and it's in, not in the user's, the student's native language. Um, that can help them understand the materials better. Uh, so we're bringing that capability into Blackboard Assist uh, when that's been enabled, but we're not going to be requiring ally licensing for that, uh, for that student use. Uh, for the last item on this page, um, SAS uh, um, already has an automatic backup feature for courses. Really great for being able to uh, get it some, back at something that was maybe accidentally deleted or um, being able to refer back to something. Um, but we have seen in some environments that it can be quite um, excessive in terms of the use of storage. Uh, and so we're working right now on being able to better compress those um, uh, those automatic backups so it doesn't use as much storage. Uh, so some other projects that we're working on that are a little further out. Uh, I mentioned that we have uh, you know, projects going on related to improving the content editor. I'll highlight two here. Uh, the first one that we're working on is improving the consistency uh, between the authoring and the viewing of that content. Um, so right now there's not um, as much consistency in terms of things like font sizes or color or spacing. And a lot of that has to do with the complexity of all the different style sheets that are involved in rendering that. There is the style sheet of the editor itself, there in the course, uh, the theme package that's in your learn environment, um, CSS that might be linked and added to the content by the author. Um, and we have some conflicts going on with that that we're working to resolve. Uh, the other uh, one, another example of an enhancement we're working on for the content editor has to do with a, an enhancement that was added in November. Um, so previous to November, if you wanted to add an image, you had to go through the add content workflow. We added the capability to be able to copy and paste an image into the editor from a website or a document. Um, unfortunately, we encountered some performance issues with that, so we have pulled back on that feature for now uh, as we work on trying to resolve those performance uh, those performance issues and being able to bring that capability back into the editor. Um, an improvement for instructors is uh, improving the grading workflow. There are some circumstances where if you're grading in a filtered view, so you're grading by assignment or by student, uh, and you're going through that workflow, if you either you know, leave your computer and start a new session, or in some cases on the server side, we've reassigned the user to a different, uh, you know, different server node, uh, that filter can get lost. So as the user's navigating, they're suddenly in a, in a different grading context. So we're working to improve that experience for graders and instructors. And then finally, the last one I'll close on for today is an example of projects that we're working on. Um, you know, we've heard a lot of feedback about how it's really important for um, institutions to better be able to manage the use of storage in their environments. So one of the projects that we're working on now is to allow setting a maximum file size for user uploads on the system. Um, and as part of that, if a user is, is attempting to upload too large of a file, they're warned within that workflow that they can't upload the file. And then optionally, um, you can configure whether to direct users to a different storage location that you define. And so with that, I will turn it over to Wade Fields to continue on the next section. Great, thank you. I think you just had 400 plus screams of joy from the file upload uh, that you just shared there. So that's, that's, that's impressive. Uh, well done. All right, so let's switch over and we're gonna start with a little rap. Pro, yeah. Professor Larry Cal. 
Uh. We about to break it down. Yeah. Ultra. You want to require all the knowledge? Take this wisdom like pearls so y'all can inspire and accomplish. Then go take on the world. Now, we ready to break it down on some ultra bass nav, simple symbols, and some icons that you might not ever had. Plus, is the ad like math, a similar concept. Whenever you're clicking on it's because you want to be animal content or common all over the web or wherever you want to roam. For example, announcements. Check out the megaphone. Maybe you never phone home and like to text instead. Look for the icon with script for the text you get from the professors and yes and some are better of course well you can check the star for your favorite course of course pencil is editor or write and fit more looking for attendance better check out the clipboard you want to be getting more options and you probably should click this them three little dots often called the ellipsis all right so i can't uh, i won't have time to give that entire rap session but uh i have been called to the table uh, by that by that song uh, <laughs> I, I do an ultra song every year but it's nothing like that uh and that that was uh ridiculously impressive and this just shows the creativity that our clients have this was not a blackboard thing um that our clients have when introducing ultra uh so really excited when we saw that just had to uh share that with you folks today uh, okay so let's get into um it was like university of uh dc right something i think that's who it was um we can get the the url for people by the way uh, but they did a fantastic job, just really brilliant. Uh, so that was really, really impressive. All right, so we're going to start today. I want to start with some recent improvements that have been released in the last few months. And so last webinar, we spoke about HTML in Ultra and how anticipated the feature was. You know, HTML, to recap, is a powerful tool to be able to elevate content in your course. One of the elements we continue to think about is data security when it comes to HTML creation. The strategy we used uh, to ensure data security, and it did do that, but it did have a, a ripple effect of, of change for a small number of clients, right? And, and we believe that we're on the other side of that and we're excited to have HTML en enabled in your environments in a data secured fashion. Now, peer assessment, it's available now. How exciting is that? It's a great way to engage learners and it really does help develop and assess critical thinking, appraisal and communication skills. And we've really made peer review super easy to set up and use. Uh, we have that option as an assignment type, and it's really going to allow us to, um, you'll be able to set evaluation and completion date and the number of required reviews. And as part of the assignment workflow, students are, are shown their peer submissions and they're able to give that qualitative feedback. And really what sets this apart is that we spent lots of times with institutions around the world listening and learning about how they'd like to see peer assessment work. So this impl implementation is unique compared to similar tools in other learning environments partially because um, uh, it's part of that standard assignment submission workflow and those, those grading workflows, and also from the fact that late participants and the handling of their lateness in terms of how it's flagged for graders. In our competitor solutions, late submitters or evaluators are locked out of the process. And, th and really, that isn't realistic for th how things are in the real world, where just everybody isn't perfect. Over the last few years, we've continued to lean into the group workspace. And from the early days of allowing creation of a course level group, now up to now where we have the ability to segment content by user or group. So let's do a quick demo and see how it works. All right, so I am gonna just pop out of here really quick. One moment, please. And uh, really quickly, as before we get into this, I also want to show that we have the new message indicator uh, on the messages on base navigation. Uh, so if I was to navigate over there, you see it kind of reduces focus in order to know that you're in the right space. Um, and you can see I have some unread messages here, so I would just quickly click into that. Um, and once I click into one of those discussions, or one of those messages, apologies, I can see um, that message there quickly. When I 
pop out and go back into my courses. That has, uh, that has reduced a number. So very exciting uh, new feature in that space. And just a, a, a small item that is uh, really exciting to see. Um, now, when we get into this, into our course, you know, we'll be able to show how we can now have the additional um, ability to release by user or group. Um, so I'm just going to start with this uh, research methods here and be able to uh, show that here very quickly. Uh, so you have our release conditions. And in the release conditions, we have the opportunity to be able to um, release content to individuals or, uh, and you can see here that all members are, um, are currently seeing this content, right? So if we wanna make it as select uh, specific members or groups, I can easily just start and work our way down the list so I can add this individual. I can also add uh, a, a particular group. So I'm gonna add, add new group here as well. Now you'll notice here that there is a create new group set. So if I didn't have a group created that I wanted to make this for, we added this in to make the workflow much easier for our instructors rather than having to click out and go create the group set. They can simply do that workflow through here. And then additionally, they can actually add the date and time perform the date and time and the performance indicators uh, as criteria criterion for releasing of the content as well. Um, so lots of variability with this, and I go ahead and hit save, and that content will be specific to those, uh, those particular users. You can see I now have this done by course member, date, time, and performance, and if I hover over it, it gives me a much stronger indication of the response, the, the requirements in order to release this particular feature. So just a very quick overview on that. I wanna make sure that we continue along with our presentation here, so we'll move on. So we know that HTML can be powerful, but not everyone has the necessary skills to be able to create engaging HTML. So we knew we had to expand functionality in our rich text editor as well. So giving more options like WCAG 2.1 AA compliant colors and assortment of new fonts and being able to control the font size as well as better format controls will allow instructors to create more engaging pages. However, we aren't done in this space yet. Inactive develop development right now is the option to add tables, which I'll speak to in just a little bit. And following that work on tables, we're gonna be looking towards uh, code blocks and to be entered into the rich text editor without having the code execute on page. And then finally, that need for visual education has been amplified as more people have become used to a construct where communication is done by both the written word and an accompanied emoji to share the intent of the message. With the addition of emojis, that social constructivism and collaborate on, or collaborative online activities really become an engaging way to share thought amongst peer and instructors. You know, ease of grading is essential when it comes to your learning environment, and we took feedback from many early adopters that wished for a way to be able to grade with the rubric and work through a paper at the same time. And we created a new navigation pattern based off of that. Now we quickly followed up with the option to reduce the description of the assessment in order to further refine the use of the real estate on the page. However, again, we aren't done. In development right now, uh, we are creating the option to collapse the right panel, and we're inter introducing independent scrolling options for both the right pane and the main panel so that instructors can set the page exactly as they would like to and make that grading as efficient as possible. So finally in this air, in this section, have you ever had a time where you get an odd error that you've never seen before and you, and you dutifully call the support line and explain what the error is? just to not have it happen again when you're talking to support. You know, it's kind of like when you hear a rattle in the car and you take it into the shop and the mechanic says nothing's wrong with it, right? Well, cars have improved and have diagnostics to help the mechanic understand better what might be happening to them, what might happen, be happening to the car under the hood. And we needed to do the same thing. So we created the session debug option for both instructors and students. So instructors and students can pause if they see something that is acting incorrect and grab a code that can be sent to their administrator. The administrator can take that code and see the last 30 clicks the users did before the uh, before the issue happened and help troubleshoot or send that valuable information to blackboard support for further investigation 
we're introducing a new section uh, called what has changed and these are things that may have changed since the last time you saw the roadmap in this section we're going to be talking about those changes and, and explaining the rationale as to why those have changed or in this case something new has been added to the roadmap uh, that was not anticipated so blackboard has been informed that the existing externally provided cloud storage solution used in learn original in ultra is going away and because we understand and recognize the importance of providing access to cloud storage providers in the learning management system we're actively working on a replacement solution um, and this re replacement solution will include things like uh, it'll allow all existing cloud providers to be maintained, including Microsoft OneDrive, OneDrive for Business, Google Drive, Dropbox, and Box. And we're actually looking for ways to uh, support back backwards compatibility with this solution. So there'll be no need to upgrade for any of our customers, regardless of their deployment type. That means self SaaS, self-hosted and managed hosted. Uh, the new solution will be open source so that we can actually manage and support capabilities. Um, at, so if we need to do uh, feature enhancements on it in the future. Um, and this new solution will also allow for more granular permission controls um, as when the institution is concerned about granting higher level permission, permissions to specific personnel or uh, institutional accounts. Now, as we look a little bit farther out, uh, we're looking at one to three months and some of the items that will be coming out during that time frame. Uh, you know, Blackboard has long promoted standards as the basis for third-party developers and partners to customize and extend our EdTech platform. As we continue to evolve Learn Ultra and supporting those deeper and more seamless integrations, we are very pleased to announce a recent enhancement around our proctoring framework. This, this framework is built on top of the very latest IMS LTI proctoring standard and it was defined and created by proctoring and assessment organizations and we are proud to be the first LMS provider to be certified against this standard. We also have combined these standards with our deep premium APIs to support the best possible end user experience for instructors and students. And we have been working closely with some key proctoring providers during the course of this development to ensure alignment and consistency for our mutual clients. And we look forward to announcing more in the upcoming weeks. You know, dropping, uh, dropping a score for students is really about uh, efficiency for instructors right so uh, by allowing the lowest score to be removed from a grade the instructor can indicate that there will actually be no makeup exams or retesting thus saving the instructor precious time let's see how you can do this in ultra as this highly anticipated uh, feature recently just hit our test servers all right so I'm back in our course and I'm going to jump into the grade center um, and then I'm going to jump into the overall grade and then slide over to calculation details. When I'm in the calculation details, uh, you will be able to see if you use grade category weights, this new option to add a rule. Uh, by adding this rule, uh, we can actually drop or um, at, drop highest or lowest scores. So I'm going to go ahead and add that rule. The first thing you'll notice, whoops, as I double click that, apologies. So I have seven items on this test area, so it's going to be a good area to do that reduction. So I'm going to go ahead and enable that. And then I'm going to drop the uh, lowest score from this category uh, because there was a test that ended up being very difficult and none of the students did very well on it. But I'm actually going to drop the highest score because there's some sort of nefarious scheme and people overscored on a particular test. So I can actually drop both of those and I can uh, go ahead and continue. When I do that, that rule will get added to that particular item. Now we have uh, seven items in here. And so for categories like this, you'll be able to um, do n minus one, right? So you'll be able to do six items uh, removed from this category if you'd want to. Once you hit the seventh item, the system's going to tell you, hey, you're removing everything from this category. Does it make sense to continue with the category or just remove it from the calculation overall? Um, so that is just a high level overview of that particular functionality, but really excited to have it release here. 
Okay. MS Teams. A Blackboard support for Microsoft Teams has evolved since the early stages of 2020 when the COVID-19 pandemic drove a shift to remote learning and Microsoft and Blackboard partnered to create the Microsoft Teams meeting scheduler LTI app for the Blackboard Learn LMS. Now fast forward to 2021, and Microsoft and Blackboard are partnering again on a more fully featured Microsoft Class Teams for Education LTI app um, that's going to be available for the Blackboard Learn Ultra course view. Uh, this integration combines the benefit of the core data exchange between Blackboard Learn and Microsoft Azure AD. So the LTI open standard, and again, that power of the Blackboard's premium API frameworks is going to make it very simple for instructors to use Teams within their Blackboard Learn Ultra courses because the rosters are gonna be automatically synced. That's cool. You know, as part of that ongoing development, we're launching a technical preview program with a select number of customers to trial and gain feedback on this functionality. I will let everybody know that we already have uh, the maximum number of institutions that can be part of this pilot right now. Uh, but Blackboard is targeting the completion of this and general availability on this integration in, Q in uh, the third quarter of 2021, just in time for multiple institutions kind of back to school uh, rituals in the fall. As you saw in our earlier demo, we continue to engage on client requested feature. One small but mighty improvement is the addition of the new message indication on Ultra Base Nav. This capability will clearly identify to users the number of new messages they have received across all of their course enrollments, whether this be original or Ultra Course View. Now we have a major enhancement for our Middle Eastern clients. I say regularly, we are a global company and we are introducing full right to left language support inside of Learn Ultra. This work has been in, in development for some time and we're really excited to bring this capability to our Arabic and Hebrew speaking markets. This capability is going to include full right to, uh, full right to left flipped user interface, including um, base navigation, ultra course view, and the administration panels. Um, it also includes enhancements to the ultra rich text editor to allow those users to write in right to left languages to adjust text direction display. And it's going to provide system level Arabic and uh, Hebrew language support and also um, ultra course view language enforcement. So a big project and very excited to get that out. Grading with rubrics supports institutional transparency and allows students to be able to see clearly what they will be graded against when completing an assessment. We continue to lean into improvements to our rubric tool. Alongside the work that we did to make the rubric tool easier to access in the grading workflow, we've also been working on deepening the functionality of the tool itself. So coming in the June release, rubrics will now have the option to have feedback by criterion. This allows instructors to dynamically give feedback on individual rows versus having to give all of their feedback in a more summative fashion. Now, so for quite some time now, we've had the option to give audio video feedback to students from the grading workflow. And giving audio video feedback really helps remove that feeling of isolation for students, and it greatly personalizes the student experience. So given the past year of instruction has been mainly online, it became apparent that we needed to extend this personalized options to more areas of the course room. So with the June release, we'll be adding the audio video functionality, not only to the course announcement framework, uh, but as well to peer assessment. And we're gonna continue to monitor the usage of these tools uh, in those spaces, and we look forward to extending them to even more areas of the course room at a later time. You know, early adopters have been asking for a better way to customize the Ultra gradebook, and we have, of course, been listening to their feedback. So in the July release, you'll be given a new way to apply filters to your gradebook. Uh, you'll first will have the ability to filter your gradebooks by groups. That alone is pretty exciting, but that is not all that not all that you will be getting. You'll also be getting the ability to apply multiple filters at once and you'll no longer have to just know what filter options are available to you. With this work, 
we'll be adding a new side panel that will show you all available options and you can apply multiple filters to your gradebook at one time. This change in experience will actually allow us to create even more filter options faster and it will continue to give greater visibility to instructions on uh, to instructors, excuse me, on options available to them. Now, while we won't have the option to save filters in this first version, you will be able to bookmark them on your browser and the filters will stay applied if you use this method. It's pretty exciting. So earlier I spoke to the rich text editor improvements that you can already take advantage of. Now we get to talk more about adding tables. Tables are an effective option to enhance the quality of an ultra document. It allows the instructor to provide large amounts of information in a shorter time span. And tables offer a different visual element that can effectively capture and present inform information if done well. So this work will allow the user to create tables on all form factors. So creating a table on a tablet or a smartphone just got really easy. Uh, instructors will also be able to add text alongside of images uh, doing, oops, excuse me, uh, is, Controls are actually very straightforward and intuitive uh, once the tables have been established in order to maximize efficiency and maintenance of the table itself. Badger, so Blackboard is excited to announce a deeper partnership with Concentric Sky, the makers of the Badger credentialing solution. Blackboard and the Badger team have been working closely together to support access to digital credentials within Blackboard Learn, supporting use cases on how instructors can award badges to students based on key triggers and how institutions can manage the creation and deployment of those learning pathways. So this initial set of integrations will provide the following. We will have a free solution called Badger Spaces available to all Learn SAS deployments, allowing instructors and issuers to create and award badges. There also will be support for Badger Pro, providing more in-depth capabilities around the institution management of learner pathways, the learner record support, and leaderboard capabilities, et cetera. And finally, we have the, uh, oops. Finally, we have uh, the creation of a Blackboard assignment objective, which allows learners to complete LMS objectives by completing Blackboard linked assignments. This is also available for the original experience as well. This last, the last items in this section uh, focus on our mobile experience. We continue to align our mobile solution to our web responsive version of Learn Ultra. As you can see, we are optimizing our discussion board flows, giving easier access to collaborate recordings, as well as giving a much clearer indication in the app that a collaborate session is in progress. This type of work shows how we continue to deepen our integration within our own solutions far beyond what any third party solution could offer. Finally, we'll be releasing full support of journals in the app as well. So as Nico noted earlier, we're, we're you know, working our way out and looking at uh, the three to six month timeline now. Uh, Blackboard is in active development on a brand new course overview landing page for Ultra courses, which will be an evolution of the existing interface that is available today. This has been highly prioritized and is based on direct feedback from instructors, students, and is also part of Ultra's long-term vision. So this capability provides quick views of direct information on the, uh, for, for the end user and will be tailored depending on your role in the course. This work will be phased in over time, and the first phases will include a new banner option for instructors that will provide visual evidence to students that they landed in the right space. This is especially important for our younger students who are growing their skills in reading. Now, we're actively working with a number of clients regarding later milestones, particularly particularly around the analytic options that will be available for instructors. So please look to community.blackboard.com for surveys or research opportunities if you'd like the chance to give feedback. Another project in active development that I'm quite excited about is progress tracking. We are currently targeting a Q3 2021 delivery for phase one of this project. It will include the ability for instructors to turn on or off progress tracking for students and give the capability for students to be able to mark activities as completed, both manually or in some cases automatically. 
part of the phase two delivery will be to offer direct analytical visualizations of student progress for instructors. Now the principles of progression can be found in many walks of life, but I really like to link it to modern uh, modern day game theory. Using something like progress tracking allows students to feel elements of success along the way and it's really a light form of encouragement from the from the system. You know it gives the students the the feeling that they're being successful as they progress through the course because it it will be able to tell them visually that and they'll be able to visually understand that progress is being made. You know this is also going to help students know where they need to spend their time on in future sessions as it will be much easier for them to reorient themselves to the last place that they were working prior to ending the previous session. You know, one of the most uh, powerful elements about being on SAS is the ability to keep all clients on the latest and greatest version of our product. However, we understand that there are times during the year that that, uh, that is not ideal to release those larger features, right? So with that, that in mind, we needed to adapt our processes so that institutions can have an element of control to roll out these larger changes on their timeline. So in order to ensure there is adequate time to review these new ultra features, administrators will have the ability to review and turn on certain features over a period of time. The initial capabilities will allow administrators to turn on a feature site-wide to all users. Features will eventually default to on, but the ability provides administrators with the flexibility to review, prepare, and turn on features at a more convenient time for them. Now, these new con uh, configure set yeah, these new configuration settings will be available on the admin panel later this year. It is important to note that this will not be for every feature and is also that the timeline to move forward with a feature will vary based off the complexity of the feature itself. So as we get a little bit closer to actually launching this, please look for details on how we determine how, um, how much time features will have a flag attached to it. Um, and that is a really nice improvement in giving that element of control back to institutions, albeit temporarily. All right, earlier, we, earlier we saw some examples of projects that uh, are helped to improve our inclusiveness inside of Blackboard Learn. So here's some other projects that are in the, in the works. We spent an extensive amount of time doing the research on this. We spent time with student groups, institution leaders. We did surveys on this because we needed to, uh, we learned that we needed to strike the right balance between institution data processes, user control, and transparency. So the first thing that we're going to be doing is focusing on pronouns and name pronunciation. So students can will be able to determine their preferred pronouns either in their system of record, their SIS, or in Learn. Now students can also uh, set their name pronunciation, making the feature uh, relevant for even more students. And it can be displayed to classmates and their instructors in, in those key interaction points. As we look a little further out, Later, we're going to be giving students the choice between, between displaying their given name and an additional name. So if the, stu the students will see the, dis the, the display name and instructors can see both the name, both names so that they can relate to the student um, and then also relate uh, back to the system of record as well. So if I wanted to go by Curtis Fields instead of Wade Fields, um, I could put Curtis as my preferred name and my students would, the students would see Curtis, the instructors would see Wade and Curtis there. Points-based rubrics. Again, this is a continuation of, of our work inside of the rubric space. We have we will have the opportunity to be able to add points and points range. And at this time, we'll be we will be adding the ability to have more rubric level uh, rows as well as uh, the criterion uh, both in row and column format. So there are so many great things that we'd like to talk about today, but we just do not have the time. So I'm going to re recap these quite quickly. We are actively working on giving students a submission receipt when papers have been submitted. And we will continue to work on the rich text editor and add those emojis and code block, as I mentioned earlier. And we're also introducing micro reactions to Ultra. However, you'll have to wait until Blackboard World to hear more about it. But wait. 
We aren't done. Milestone two of submission receipts will be to create the instructor report of the receipts. This will make it easy for instructors and students to understand exactly what was saved in the solution and will greatly reduce the dog ate my virtual homework excuse. Uh, we are also working to ensure that Blackboard data receives information from Ultra in the most efficient way possible. Finally, we have some smaller options that have a big impact. Some instructors don't like to use the overall grade, so we're making, making it simple to hide it. Similarly, some instructors don't want to use a letter grade and prefer to use percentage. We're adding that option. Absent, you'll note, is points, as it proved to be a little more challenging to display, but it will be added in the future. Finally, we're going to be looking at some thematics uh, look, as we look six months plus out, and we will go ahead and get started with that. So as we move farther out, again, we're talking more thematically about the items that we'll be working on. So let's start with notifications. We live in a time in history where communication is easier than ever, but with that ability comes challenges. While it's easy to communicate, it's become more challenging to communicate effectively. Now, I myself am a child of the email era. I remember using Lotus Notes and complaining that I could just pick up the phone and walk down to a person's office if I wanted to communicate with them. Soon, however, uh, email became my most important way to communicate. And that's really not the case any longer. Some people prefer text messages. Some want pushes sent to their phone that will prompt them that there's something they need to react to. I mean, who hasn't uh, had a notification that their hearts are full and that they can play their mobile game again, right? Um, beyond that, even other, even other communicate through social media, right? And with all these avenues, it's challenging to know how to best communicate with students so you can ensure that they see the communication. And that's where we come in. We're taking a hard look at all of our communication options in order to effectively create a system that will ensure to instructors that their messages have the best chance of getting in front of their students as, and vice versa. Already in Learn, you can assign parallel markers. Um, we also uh, are going to be leaning into our critical grading and assessment framework. Um, we also understand that, uh, that test security is very important. So we are looking for multiple ways to improve that framework. We're going to start with uh, questions being able to be displayed one at a time to students, but we'll also continue to lean on the work we did late last year and offer more display option results as well. These again, they're examples of what our focus will be. Uh, we noted in the beginning that roadmaps become less certain the farther out we look, but these, are, these examples are indicative of what our thinking currently is. We spoke earlier about the core value streams that we have for Learn Ultra this year. Supporting the best in class pillar is our work that we're doing with cloud providers, including Google and Microsoft. Along with the work we already have in progress with Microsoft, we are continuing to strengthen and deepen the M365 solution suite inside of Learn Ultra. And we have a number of areas that we are continuing to explore. Uh, Microsoft's LTI meetings app to allow end users to invite, schedule, and access team meetings within a Learn Ultra. We're also expanding the capabilities on file discovery, file linking, document collaboration, and grade flows by leveraging Microsoft's OneDrive LTI application. And we're also exploring different synergies with Blackboard Ally and Immersive Reader. A key aspect to, of the integration approach we are leveraging for Microsoft is it, it's going to allow us to support extensibility for providers such as Google and the Google's tool set. An example of this is how we're architecting the data exchange between Learn for both of these solutions. So I've shown multiple examples today where we are investing resources into deepening functionality into our existing product. We believe that this is critical to the long-term success of Ultra, so we'll be continuing to invest in this area. We take client feedback very seriously and continue to use this feedback as a mechanism for change inside of our existing products. Look for changes to how learning modules function, improvements to the drag and drop experience, as well as more granular options for accommodations from these teams as we surge into the second half of the year. Again, these are just examples of the opportunities we look for, but are ones that have been amplified by your feedback from you, our users. With this, I will let Nico wrap up in the last couple of minutes that we have. All right, so first things first, um, BB World is just around the corner, so please join us uh, on July. 
uh, more information to come on your way. Um, the, oops, there we go. And finally, well, some some final uh, things that we wanted to share with you guys. So the the advisory group uh, that we have been mentioning, please join it. Join us in in the advisory advisory group as well to give us your feedback. Um, the learn office hours. Congrats on on your four year, four year anniversary. This use for this user group, um, but mainly. What you see here, please join the community. Please ask your questions through the community. If you have any any additional questions or feedback, please share them through this links that I'm sharing in the chat. And as we said before, the recording and the, the slides are going to be um, uploaded in the community site and sent via email. So, that would be it. Thanks so much for joining today's session, guys. Until next time.